who was brought up in mostly in the North Bay area and has for various good reasons become pretty attuned to nature during his time here in various ways. Um, he teaches uh, environmental studies up at Canador now and he's going to talk to us uh, about an aspect about which we all started including him tonight's meal as he will admit because this special meal that was provided tonight was all from the land and he's going to talk about a year of living off the land so welcome Jeremy Thank you. Hey. Hello. I have a YouTube channel and some people are going to want to see this talk. Um, the wonderful thing about social media is you can put out a poster and then people that are connected to you in places like Oklahoma and Connecticut are like, oh, I really wish I could come and see your talk, but <laughs> it's really far away. Um, so I'm going to talk about what it will take to eat a wild food diet for 365 days. And uh, I'm going to cover a couple of different parts of this. So I'm going to talk about why I would ever want to do something like that. In fact, I'm not the only one who does. So there are two of us. My girlfriend Delphine is also going to embark on this long adventure with me. Uh, what we are considering a modern hunter-gatherer diet or eating wild foods because we're not planning to just go to a grocery store and find wild-caught salmon where we're going out and collecting. Uh, what the types of things are that we'll be eating. How we think that we'll feel doing this experiment and also uh, how people can participate in uh, eating from the wild. So why? Uh, why would I want to do this? So a few things that I've done in the past uh, is with a friend of mine who's got a channel called The Wooded Beardsman. Uh, we did something that we were calling the Wilderness Living Challenge. In uh, 2016, we spent five days and our challenge was to go out and only eat what we could catch. And we ate all kinds of food. We ate 17 pike, we ate some perch, we ate blueberries, we ate more bunchberries than I've ever eaten in my life. We were eating clams. We caught snails out of a lake and we cooked them. Uh, we were eating greens. We were eating pink cherries. I ate every day for those five days. I lost 10 pounds. And I was really kind of baffled by that experience because I thought I was not going to lose that weight. Um, the next year we thought, I don't know what we did wrong in the first time, but we're going to do this again. We're going to run a season two. And these were YouTube videos that he posted on his channel. Uh, we're going to run a season two. We're going to do it differently, though. We're not just going to eat 17 pike. We're going to um, catch beavers. We're going to eat a groundhog. I also, in the middle of our seven days, uh, by accident, well, not I guess by accident, I happened to find a bear, a roadkill bear on the highway that was fresh. Um, so as you can imagine, in a seven-day period, we had more food than we could possibly eat, and we ate lots of it, and I still lost 4.2 pounds eating healthy, wild, from the land food. Uh, and so that also baffled me a little bit. <laughs> so based on that uh, chance that we happened to have so much extra food after running our seven day experiment, I decided to just carry on. I was just gonna keep eating wild food for as long as I could uh, because I already had half a bear in the freezer. I had all this leftover beaver stew that we had not eaten. Uh, I had catfish, I had berries, and so on. And ultimately, I did it for a 35-day period. And what I wanted to know was, if I just keep eating until I'm full, am I going to just continue to lose weight forever? Or am I just going to lose weight up to a point, and then my weight will stabilize at some new level? Uh, you know, Would I get tired of eating wild foods? And there were definitely some things that I ate like every day, and I couldn't figure out, I had this magic stew pot of beaver stew and it never was empty. And every time I thought that it was empty, then I would see that it had hidden some in the freezer or in my fridge somewhere and I had to keep eating beaver stew over and over. So I did get tired of some wild foods, but not of others. Uh, so I, you know, I wondered if I would have the quantity and the quality to keep me interested through this experiment. 
and I wanted to know if I would get hungry enough or interested enough that I would go out and seek other wild foods that I hadn't eaten before. And so this wasn't new for me. Uh, I've always been interested in wild foods and survival and camping. Um, my mother was always interested in wild foods and herbs, and so I started learning about them at a young age and continued with that through my whole life. Um, and so I, I did this 35-day experiment. I documented it uh, with some weekly video updates that I posted to a YouTube channel of mine, uh, and uh, that was a very, very eye-opening experience for me. So. I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened at the end of it, but just a little bit further down in my presentation. So what was I calling a modern hunter-gatherer diet for that experiment, and what are we considering to be a wild food diet for a one-year uh, period? We're basically eating foods that we catch, that we trap, that we go fishing for, that we pick, that we find. They sometimes find fresh things on the road. Uh, or things that are gifted to us. So I've, I've talked to people about this plan and they are very sympathetic, maybe a little bit worried, and so they are offering, oh, I work, we really want to feed you. <laughs> we're going to find some wild food for you too. Um, we're working within fish and game laws, which are uh, different from the way that people would have historically or traditionally gathered food. The seasons are different and where you can go are different, uh, but we are working within fish and game laws. And we are also gathering in advance of when our year starts. So we will be stockpiling some food in advance. And I think we basically started in just the last couple of days. So everybody probably knows this is maple syrup. Uh, and I did two and a half liters from our very first boil of maple syrup. And I'm going to hide this somewhere in my house so my children don't find it. And that's going to be part of our wild food year. Uh, we also hadn't really thought this far ahead, but um, there are some things that we won't be able to get that we'll really want, and I thought maybe we would just cheat and buy a box of salt, uh, but Delphine felt very strongly that we should make something from natural materials or from a wild craft and trade that to somebody who is gathering salt and, or making salt in a traditional way. Uh, so we will be trading for some things that we can't otherwise find. We are planning to plant a few spices. Um, so mainly we're thinking about planting some hot peppers and uh, I put in a big patch of garlic uh, and we're gonna include those in our wild food year. Rules are also subject to change. So <laughs> we're not trying to starve ourselves to death. Uh, you know, we're not gonna buy stuff from a grocery store but if we do find ourselves traveling or starving, we might try and pick a wild caught salmon out of a grocery store or something. Uh, but these are sort of just our baseline rules about what we're considering to be a modern hunter-gatherer experiment. This is not very clear, but uh, in the seven-day wilderness living challenge, we went out, so we, we had the two beavers, we had a groundhog, we had a whole bear. Uh, we could have just sat at a campfire and eaten for five days, but my friend and I decided to go fishing and we caught about 35 pounds of catfish that night, which uh, was a little bit ridiculous. That's a 13.4 pound channel catfish that we caught in the Mattawa River. Uh, and then later that month, when I was starting to run out of wild foods, Delphine and I went back and caught six more big channel catfish out of that same spot. And they also made up a pretty big portion of my 35 day diet. So. Where do you go from that? From a five day to a seven day to 35 days, we're going to jump to the big year. And I know a lot of people in this room know what a big year is about because you do it when you're birding, right? You have a big year, you go out, and you're going to find as many different birds as you can. I'm doing the exact same thing, and I'm going to eat them all. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if you would throw stuff at me or laugh at that. <laughs> so people are pretty serious about their birds. Um, so this is like a big wild food year for me, right? I've done like some wild food meals, uh, wild food for a stretch of time, and now we would like to do the challenge and have a big year. So this is 2019, we're planning January 1st until the end of December of 2019. So all of 2019, no grocery stores. Uh, some of the things that we're really gonna focus on are timing the abundance of food availability. 
so there are certain things that are available for a short period of time in the year and maybe not that available for the rest of the year. So maple syrup, now is our chance to get all the maple syrup we need from January 1st until basically April of 2019 and then hopefully we'll have made new maple syrup in that year to carry us through for the rest of the year. We are looking at different ways of preserving the abundance that we catch so that we can eat it throughout the year. So maple syrup is easy because you boil it down and jar it and it never goes off. Uh, if you're thinking of things like berries and wild greens, some of them are only available for a short period of time and you have to figure out how to save them up and then use them through the year. And because we're not buying sugar, we can't really make jam in the way that you might normally make a berry preserve. Um, and so we're looking at other ways of storing those uh, piles of food that you get periodically to last you through. Um, I want to do some thinking about macronutrients and micronutrients. Uh, so one of the things that I felt before is that I wasn't getting enough of my food as fat. I was eating a lot of lean protein uh, and, and plant-based basically. And so interested to make sure that we have enough fats through the year. Uh, to get a good balance. The uh, wild plants are especially high in micronutrients relative to the types of things that you would buy in a grocery store. And so very interested also to look at which plants are providing the most of different kinds of micronutrients. Maple syrup, for example, is very high in manganese. Uh, and different plants are known to have higher levels of certain micronutrients. We want to maximize our efficiency of harvest but staying within game laws. So one thing I often think about is I can get one deer tag in a year and I might go and spend 10 days hunting deer and then not get a deer. Uh, but I could also get a license and go out and spend 10 days hunting geese and I might shoot 100 pounds of geese in those 10 days, right? Which is more meat than I would get off of any deer that I might get. And so we have to think about, well, the hunting season is a certain period of time, where is our effort best spent to get the most bang for our buck, uh, to make a bad pun. And this is Delphine's forte here, but figuring out flavors and spices. So aside from the peppers and the garlic that we're growing, most of our flavors and spices will come from wild spices and wild sources. And uh, that is a less practiced, uh, art, I think, for wild food gathering. A lot of people eat wild foods from going fishing and going hunting, but not very many people are using spices from different plants to augment those flavors. And so that's a big area of exploration for us. So one year, <clears throat> this might not be super clear, but I did look up some data. I'm 39, and according to the uh, United States Department of Agriculture, uh, in one year as a healthy, active male, I should take or require about 3,000 calories per day, and over a year that's 1,095,000 calories, if I'm doing it as a calorie count. I've been wearing a Fitbit for a couple of years, and actually you could just pull up your whole year's worth of steps, or your whole year's worth of how many calories you've burnt, and so on, and my last one year of calories worked out to uh, just a little bit less than 1.2 million calories in a year. So that's pretty close to this 1.1 figure. And so I'm figuring that you know if I'm following that, I should be looking at 1.2 million calories of wild food. What is 1.2 million calories of not wild food? <laughs> okay. This is 1.2 million calories, 575 kilograms of ice cream. That would give you 1.2 million calories. You could eat one and a half kilograms of ice cream a day, you'd be good. 4,137 McDonald's cheeseburgers, 5,700 cans of salmon, 181 kilograms of butter, 11,000 heads of romaine lettuce. So any one of those things would give you your 1.2 million calories. So what is that in wild food calories? So it would be 2,100 kilograms of blueberries. This I was really surprised when I first 
read this, I thought blueberries were full of sugar and that if you ate a lot of them, you would get full and you would get lots of calories from them. You would have to eat 26 pounds of blueberries in a day to get 3,000 calories. So basically over a year, if you ate nothing but blueberries, you would need 2,100 kilograms of just blueberries. 571 kilograms of beaver meat. 366 liters of maple syrup. That's 1.2 million calories. 2,666 kilograms of dandelion leaves. 181 kilograms of bear fat. So that's the same as the butter. If you're going to eat butter, it would be 181 kilograms. Bear fat is the same caloric content as butter. So you could eat an equal weight of butter. Or sorry, as of bear fat. 136,500 red oak acorns. So oak acorns, traditionally in different areas, are a staple food item. Uh, and I have been eating oak acorn flour for a few years, but I would not say in abundance. But I know what it takes to gather a lot of acorns, and it would be a fair amount of work to gather 136,000 of them. Plus, if you want to eat them, you have to dry them out, you have to shell them all. You have to grind them all down. You have to run cold water through them until all the bitterness comes out. And then you have to freeze them or you have to dry them up and store them. And then you can eat them. So there's a fair bit of work uh, involved in that. So these are all one-offs. I don't know if you had to pick. It'd be kind of a toss-up. I don't know if I would be able to decide between blueberries or maple syrup if I had to have just one item. Um, but probably we're going to be eating a pretty varied diet. So if I think about the things that I ate for 35 days, um, I ate, this is beaver stew with wild cranberries and leeks. I ate a lot of that. I ate a lot of uh, roast bear. This is a five gallon pail with apples and grapes. They weren't really quite wild. Um, but I stole them from my mom's house. <laughs> so it, it felt like it was close enough. I had to go through all the work of picking them at least. Uh, I ate a lot of that. And these are the six catfish that Delphine and I caught. Um, and I ate a lot of <coughs> catfish also. Um, a full list of what I ate in that 35 day period might surprise you a little bit. This is very small. I don't know that you want me to read out all of the animals, but um, I ate snowshoe hare, groundhog, beaver, bear, and a little bit of bear fat that I previously stored in my freezer. I ate grouse, goose, and duck. I ate pickerel, channel catfish, rock bass, perch, and speckled trout. These are all berries that I ate. These are all plants that I ate. These are all different species of wild mushrooms that I ate, and these are all insects that I ate. I know you want me to read out the insects, so I ate crickets, and I ate grasshoppers, I ate ant eggs, I ate the little grubs that come out of acorns when they are impregnated by the uh, weevil, so I ate the little white grubs, they're super tasty, and I collected some hazelnuts, and they also have um, grubs that will crawl out of them, and I ate a bunch of those. So this was a small part of my 35 day diet, um, but it kind of shows the diversity that I ate in that case. Here is a breakdown of 1.2 million calories from wild food staples. So if I have these items in this quantity, I will end up with this many calories, 1.2 million calories, and this is for one person, so we have to double this, um, or maybe a little bit less than double. Yeah. A little less than double. Yeah. We'll double it, and I'll eat your extra portion. So, um, what I've got here are wild leek bulbs, are something that we really like for flavoring other dishes, and also to just pickle them and eat them. They're really fabulous. I put 40 pounds. I don't know that we're going to pick 40 pounds of leeks for a, for a year, but this is basically 11,000 calories. Um, I have 400 pounds of wild fish of various types written down. That would give you 220,000 calories. So that's 
more than a pound of fish per day and it's giving me less than a fifth of the calories I need. It's interesting, and I'm going to talk about that specifically in a minute. Uh, 400 pounds of acorns, 400 pounds of wild greens. So if you just even add up the big ones, you can see that I'm going to have to eat a pound of fish, a pound of acorn flour, and a pound of wild greens, and then double that, or less, for Delphine also, uh, basically 5.2 pounds of food per day from different sources, and that would give 1.2 million calories. And I've got a couple of different kinds of meats on here. I've got wild rice, maple syrup, geese, sedge seeds. Uh, so sedges grow in Laurier woods. You see them growing with the cattails and along uh, logging roads. And we were really surprised to find how quickly you can gather a very large quantity of sedge seeds. And interestingly, there is no uh, or not easily found nutritional data for sedge seeds, but I kind of compared them uh, with sunflower seeds as far as calorie content. But we picked this in 40 minutes, the two of us. So sedges, which I had never eaten before this year, the sedge seeds are now like an item that we'll definitely consider for next year. The way that I use these is I kind of threw them in a pan with a little bit of bear fat and a little bit of maple syrup and stirred them together and kind of cooked them like a really sugary granola. <laughs> Pardon me? We made pancakes. We, oh yeah, we also made the pancakes with them. Um, and were these the ones that you toasted and they smelled like popcorn? Yeah. yeah, so when you cook them they smell like popcorn. They're like really, really, a really great smell to have in a kitchen. I could even pass that around if people just are curious about it. Um, Edge seeds. So even then, this is a very small list, but it's just to give you an idea about the calorie value of different foods. We will probably eat more species of plant than your average person can identify. Uh, and what I thought was interesting is I was watching somebody's presentation in a YouTube video and they were talking about the diversity of plants that are eaten by people, so your modern uh, Western eater eats about 37 species of plant in their diet, which is very, very low diversity. And he was saying even the Inuit peoples in far northern climates, who we kind of consider to be carnivores, were eating at least 40 varieties of plants, which is more diversity than your average Western diet now. And traditional peoples in further south climates, where there's more abundance available, were eating over a hundred different species of wild plants. We'll, we'll probably eat. Well, we're going to keep track. So maybe this time next year, I can send an update to the Friends of Laurier Woods and give you a tally. So some big questions that I have are, um, number one, I think that if you look up caloric content, this is a, basically a nutrient label for pickerel fillets. Right? And from this label, I figured out, well, if I had 400 pounds of fish, I would get this many calories from them. Um, but the pickerel fillet is, you really you take off all the fat, right? You cut away the skin, you chop off the head, and then you slice out just very lean meat. Um, we did a couple of cooking experiments where we left the skin on, and then we ate the, all the soft tissues in the head, which is where all the fats are in the tongue, in the brain, in the eyeballs, and that's how people traditionally eat. They eat the whole animal. And so I think, you know, I would eat 400 pounds of pickerel fillets, but I might only need 200 pounds of eating whole fish. And I think those are some big differences. So I think you can get more calories from less uh, if you're eating more of the animal. In my 35-day uh, experiment, we, were, we ate the brains of the groundhog and of the rabbit and all those kinds of things. Uh, cooked fish with the skin on and so on. Lots of other wild foods don't have nutritional information available. So for example, the sedge seeds, it was really hard to find out um, what's actually in there. So if I cook up a cup of it, what am I getting? I don't know. I might be able to find some uh, agricultural information for that as a forage crop for sheep or cattle but that doesn't really tell me the nutritional content of just the seeds. 
uh, I tried to find out what do you get when you eat a whole fish as opposed to just the fillets. And I did quite a bit of reading online. And I will tell you, if you look up fish nutritional content, you'll find uh, research papers probably stacked about this high that tell you what you should feed to fish to grow them as fast as you can in aquaculture. <laughs> All the different feed mixes to feed to them, and you'll find nothing that tells you what you get from a fish if you just eat the whole fish. Um, and I wanted to know, like, what is in a fish eyeball? It was really hard to find. So I started, now I'm like way off track, I'm reading scientific papers about the evolution of Homo sapiens in relation to brain-friendly fat profiles of wild fish diets in the African Rift Valley. So they're basically inferring values that people are getting from eating fish and then what that what the implication was on human evolution. Um, I priced it out. I could send those seeds to a food lab and they would basically print me a nutritional label, but it cost $600 to do that each time. And I, there are, I have lots of questions about nutrient value and I don't think I can afford to uh, satisfy my curiosity. So this is that article, Rift Valley Lakefish. Um, it was really interesting. So in this article, they talk about two uh, groups of peoples, one that's eating a very piscivorous or fish heavy diet, and then another group uh, 80 kilometers away, they're basically the same genetic makeup, they're all related, and the other group that's away from the lake is uh, almost very strictly vegetarian. And they talk about what a huge difference there is in the amount of <coughs> nutrition and fat that the fish eaters are getting as opposed to the vegetarian eaters. Not the people who eat vegetarians, but the people who are eating a vegetarian diet. <laughs> uh, the other thing that I found interesting in that article is they talk about how people who live on oceans are getting much more fat from fatty ocean fish and shellfish than what you would typically get from land-based foods. So if you think about all the land animals that you hunt, they typically have a, maybe a lower fat uh, quality and quantity than ocean foods. Challenges. So I think one of the first challenges that people think that we'll face is the quantity of food that we have to get. And I feel like that's one of the smaller challenges. So based on what I did for 35 days, I know that we could call up four trappers that we know, and they're catching beaver and muskrat, and they're taking off the skin, and then throwing the rest of it away. And we could probably fill a couple freezers with beavers and muskrats and just eat that for a whole year, and we would get our 1.2 million calories. So I think that accessing quantity is probably not our biggest challenge. Quality, I think like getting enough fats into the foods that we're eating uh, and enough greens and enough fiber, like our proper mix of nutrition, that might be a challenge for us, depending on what's available, when we're available to collect it. Uh, diversity, I feel like diversity is not a challenge. You've seen the list of what I was able to eat in just 35 days. Um, and it would have been much lower, except that Delphine was worried about my lack of salads. So she put together those nice little colorful salads with all the plants and berries in them. Um, we can access lots of diversity. We've got the skills and the knowledge and the practice, and we've been scoping out spots where we can pick things. Personal persistence, a, a year-long project is very difficult to undertake. And I think that just sticking to it will be difficult, especially when there are kids' birthdays, or we're at our friend's place and there's a big potluck party, or there's Christmas, or there's Thanksgiving, and we're working at sticking to a wild food diet, but there's so many other things available, right? We might have been eating, I don't know, speckled trout for a month, and then there's a key lime pie. <laughs> that is, those are gonna be the big challenges. Um, time, so having the time available to us to be able to go out and collect and harvest and preserve, like this is a, it's a slow food thing, and it takes a lot of effort to put the food by, so I feel like having the time might be one of our issues. And another one, and Fred had a question right away about liver function uh, when I was talking about this at another venue uh, in capping my 35 day experiment is toxicity and health. So if you are a fisherman, you maybe have, and if you haven't, you should read the Ontario Guide to Eating Sport Fish. And they basically are checking uh, the toxicity 
levels of fish that you would harvest in sport fishing lakes. And so you can find out how much, oh, I'm done, sorry. Uh, they're, they're showing you how much mercury, how much lead, how much uh, pesticides you're being exposed to in the fish that are out there because they're bioaccumulating through food chains. Um, and so, you know, if we're eating lots and lots of wild fish, more than I normally ever would, uh, it is possible that we would be accumulating an unhealthy level of those toxins. Did it go to sleep? It's searching, it says. Okay. Did I put anybody else to sleep? <laughs> Just the machine? Enough protein. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, just while that's going on, yeah, you haven't mentioned tea or coffee. Or, oh yeah. I don't know if you are a tea or coffee drinker, but what are you going to do about coffee? I quit coffee before, and uh, I quit coffee recently. I'll probably start drinking coffee again, but I'll I'll quit tea and coffee for that experiment, for sure. So we're looking at other hot drinks. Delphine's pretty convinced that she will also be able to <coughs> quit caffeine. <coughs> I'm starting soon. You're starting soon. <laughs> She's got to warm up to this. She's got like six months to, to quit. Um, but we'll, we'll do other hot drinks. So we'll roast dandelion roots, chicory root. Uh, we'll collect wild teas. I'm really fond of white pine tea. Um, I make a lot of white pine tea when I'm camping. Um, different flowers and berries and so on. So no caffeine. So in your 35 day diet, did your bowel movements change? Yeah, they were pretty good. <laughs> they they were I was regular uh, they were normal and healthy I was getting a lot of fiber because Delphi was forcing me to eat lots of wild vegetable or wild leafy greens so um, that was good yeah there was nothing unusual about them yeah How, did you research research, research any safety uh, for yourself and maybe uh, some vegetation or plants that you could eat that were poisonous yeah, because I've been doing this for a while, like I have a pretty good idea about the things, and I, I would try not to eat anything except in moderation, but there are some things that you can eat too much of, just like you could eat too much key lime pie and it would have an effect on you. Um, but there are, uh, especially because I eat a lot of wild mushrooms, and I'm very careful about the mushrooms that I select because there are some that are very toxic and can do you some harm. Um, as far as plants go, I... Uh, I've had a couple that I ate by accident, but I knew right away that I shouldn't be eating them when I spit them out. So most of them are not sneaky about their toxicity or their their bad bad flavors and so on. Yeah. What about sources of calcium? Um, what was the question? Sources of calcium. When I was eating fish, um, I was also making fish broth and simmering, and I felt like there was a lot of calcium coming out of the bones. Uh, the same as cooking all the animals with the bones on. Okay. And I think calcium. Well, you definitely get calcium from the fish bones. Yeah. And if you cook them, and you could pulverize it somehow. Yeah. Just like when you buy canned salmon, and the little vertebrae are in there, and you mash it. Yeah. That's a source of calcium. Yeah. So. And would you get your blood work done? <laughs> yeah, yep. for it, please. I'm almost there. <laughs> <laughs> the question was if I would get blood work done. So that's, uh, I do have a slide. It's actually the very next slide, maybe, which is, um, bless you, uh, about how I felt. So here's the, the bowel movements of the energy level. So when I did this for 35 days, I felt great. I had lots of energy. I was really motivated in the mornings. I, I didn't leap out of bed and sing a song, uh, but I definitely was like starting my days with more energy. I <clears throat> felt like I was a little bit more observant, and that was partly a food motivation. So I, I definitely had an eye for food, like, oh, there's some edible plants, and there's some edible berries. Oh, here's this. Oh, I don't have any raspberries left in my yard. Um, I also fight, felt a lot lighter, so I lost 18 pounds by about the 28th or 30th day, and then my weight leveled off. Um, so that, that was one of my goals, like would I just keep losing weight or would I hit a level point? And I hit that level point. I have a, a friend on Facebook that I've never met, um, but he has been doing something similar. He's gone to a mostly wild food diet. He's been at it one month, 
and he lost 26 pounds, and then his weight stabilized. So I thought that was interesting that we had a similar uh, experience in a sort of similar time frame. He started out probably being heavier than I was, and I think some of that extra weight is the fastest to go, um, but his experience was similar. Some other things, like I felt like my nails were healthier, like stronger, less brittle. I usually get white spots in my nails, and those seem to be disappearing over the 35 days. My skin was healthier. I often have really dry skin, and that seemed to be less so. Um, I thought that I would be craving things, but I was not. Uh, normally, I would crave butter tarts on site, uh, or be thinking about chocolate bars and things, and I found that I was not craving those, so that was a good thing. My teeth felt cleaner. My tongue felt cleaner. I just had like a fresher feeling in my mouth. I know it's kind of a hard thing to quantify, um, but I definitely felt like that was a real thing. This is a uh, fabulous source of protein. That's me and Delphine. She's in camouflage over here. Uh, are collecting cattail pollen. So this is a spring activity in early June, and we collected a quantity of pollen when the cattail plants are flowering and you get, they get those big yellow, <coughs> excuse me, yellow spikes on the top of them. Um, and you can actually harvest a fair amount of it in a fairly short period of time. And you can use it as a flower, you can mix it with other flowers, uh, or use it as a thickener. And so that'll be one of the foods that I haven't identified previously, but that'll be on our list. So my doctor is interested in this experiment. And uh, he I asked him and he sent me a quick list on it by typing it out on his phone, so I think he might look at other things besides this, but he said weight, has resting heart rate, body fat percentage, and 5K run time at maximum exertion. I don't know how many times he's gonna make me run five kilometers to keep track of me through the year, <coughs> or leading up to the year, because we'll want some beforehand data as well. Um, and some blood tests, so he had in mind to look at hemoglobin, extended electrolytes, renal function and creatinine, liver function tests, heavy metal load, uh, serial ketones, protein levels, gallbladder and pancreas enzymes. So that's the list that he's considering, yeah. Um, if you wouldn't mind asking, there isn't anything there about your, your blood fats, eh? Blood fats? Yeah, you know, yeah. cholesterol, triglycerides, no. and um, yeah, just ask for a for serum lipids. You okay, know. serum lipids. Yes, I think please. that's one that you mentioned also, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, Jeremy, have you talked to any uh, natives, uh, indigenous people? Yes, and it's part of. Uh, the question <laughs> is, have you talked to any First Nations people uh, me. about <laughs> Delphi? Delphi's First Nations, and uh, I'm also leaning out a couple of other people for um, some advice about traditional methods of cooking, traditional foods um, that are in this area. I would like to go out and spend some time with people who are still collecting traditional foods in traditional ways. Uh, so that's it's on the list, and uh, I hope that it's a big part of that year. Yes. So you're living off the wild, not in it. Like you're taking all this stuff, bone cooking it. Yes. Okay. So in the previous experiments, we were living out of a tent with a canoe for the five days and for the seven days. For the 35 day one, I, I was seven days camping, but then the rest of it, I was uh, at home and I, I was at work. So I teach at Canada College, as was mentioned in the introduction. So it was kind of weird to be at my desk and I have students coming by and I'd have a giant bowl of apples and grapes and, and then eating like fish stew and trying to eat as many pounds of apples and grapes as I could in a day. Um, so that also, after 35 days, it got a little bit <coughs> tedious to be trying to manage collecting wild food, preparing wild food, and then also bringing it and eating it at work. Yes? And a little bit over the topic, but how are you going to manage with your children? Yeah, oh yeah, I showed a picture of them. They're eating hot dogs all year. <laughs> so, Are you going to want to eat with them or do they want to eat with you? Uh, I will still cook for them and sit with them, but I'm going to eat different food. Uh, they're not interested to eat, or they think they're not interested to eat wild food, and I'm not interested to try and collect, like for all of our children would be 
a bit much for the purposes of our experiment, uh, but my kids have been interested to have a cooking challenge where I bring wild food and then they cook it for me. So I'm not going to say no to that unless they do a really bad job. Um, and I know I'm going to have to get a freezer with a lock because blueberries and raspberries and strawberries uh, are going to start disappearing, I'm sure, from my freezer. So I'll buy the grocery store blueberries and then eat my wild ones. Another question. I, I don't know about the fish here, but are you worried about any parasites in them? Uh, no, that's a really good question. I don't usually worry about parasites. Um, I had an interesting experience where I had, uh, <clears throat> I don't know how much detail I want to get into, but um, <laughs> I had a thing happen and my doctor immediately sent me for a parasitology test. Uh, which I didn't realize, but you also you have to notify the health unit anytime your doctor recommends you for a parasitology test. So I felt a little bit singled out, um, and I did not have parasites, um, but I had eaten a lot of um, choke cherries with pounded pits that had been dried, and I think I got cut by a choke cherry pit. If that gives you enough information to figure out what the symptoms were. Uh, in other foods, like wild foods, I'm always careful to cook thoroughly. Bear is the one that I would be the most worried about because it can carry trichinosis. Um, other foods I don't usually worry about. Even people always say, oh, crickets and grasshoppers, you can get parasites from crickets and grasshoppers. Well, I searched online and there's nothing about human parasites that are transferable from crickets and grasshoppers, but you can get sick uh, if they have E. coli in their gut and you happen to ingest that in it runs away on you. No pun intended. <laughs> so what do you do with the bugs? Do you like cook them up or something to get them crunchy? Yeah. Yep. Uh, so those guys, I just fire roasted them. The uh, weevil grubs, like I, I've eaten them raw before just on a dare, but I, I'll just simmer them in a frying pan. Uh, interesting fact, if your pan is on high heat and it has hot fat in it and you drop weevil grubs in, you'll be picking them up from all over your kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> They're like popcorn. Um, and so you have to either put a lid on there or just kind of simmer them at a lower temperature. Yeah. Yes? Is the eating schedule of normal eating schedule or are you eating more regularly, more often throughout the day? Uh, the question. The question was if I had a regular eating schedule or if I was eating more through the day. And I haven't really had a super strict eating schedule, but I found like, for example, the apples and the grapes I couldn't eat as a meal. I just would eat them all day to try and get them all down. But typically I was eating meals. I was planning to eat like a lunch and a supper. Yes? How like far in advance are you planning your meals? Uh, I would imagine that you probably got things laid out as far as calorie-wise each day, like what you're planning on eating or I'm no? not planning or counting. Uh, there are definitely some foods that we're planning to stock up on, right? So like I'd love to have 50 geese and know that I had one goose per week. And from that, you know, my plan would be, well, I would eat some roast goose, but then I would also have a goose soup and then I would have goose broth that I would add other foods to. So making the most of it. And, and really, I think it's like what's available is partly going to dictate our meals. Um, but also because Delphi is a more, not pickier, but... Uh, oh, I, like, I love food. I love yeah. eating. And yeah. I just want to eat a variety and yeah. something that tastes really good. So where I would like for 35 days just keep eating beaver stew, Delphi would say, I'm not eating beaver stew today. Let's make something out of what we've got. And so that'll partly dictate our meal choices, right? Yeah. Yes? Is the liver a problem of any of the animals that you would be eating? Yes. Yeah, so liver in uh, moose and deer, they advise you that you should not eat it. I eat it from young animals, so if I shoot a fawn deer, I would eat the liver, or a year old deer, uh, or eat it in smaller portions, but they do tend to accumulate cadmium, uh, which can cause toxicity. So I would be a little bit careful about that. But I do, I was eating um, fish livers and uh, we ate the liver from the beavers, we ate the liver from the groundhog. I ate swim bladders. If you ever have a chance to roast a swim bladder over a fire, 
it turns into something you would never imagine. A swim bladder. So the swim bladder from the fish, when you pull, pull their guts out and there's a balloon inside of them, uh, in some fish it's very transparent. In a catfish, it looks like something that uh, you could blow up and play baseball with. It's like, it's opaque, it's very leathery, um, but you know, it's good, it's tasty. We cooked it, we ate it. And I think, uh, you know, because we're aiming for more than just basics, we'll probably cut that into little rings and then maybe batter them with uh, seeds and fry them in bear fat and then you basically got a calamari, right? <laughs> so that's where we're, that's what we're aiming for. Jeremy, do you hunt with a bow when you take down, take the animals? Uh, I have a little <laughs> bit, yeah, uh, often with a rifle or a shotgun. Yeah, and we're aiming for efficiency, so I would Because I was wondering if the shotguns would have an effect on the meat or the, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, because of the, if you're shooting lead pellets, then you have to really watch that you're not eating them when you eat the meat, for sure. Um, we, I've eaten goose, I almost have enough pellets that I've found in geese and ducks to make a whole other shotgun shell. Uh, so I have like a little pile of them hidden away somewhere, and then one day I'm going to do that just as a weird thing to do. It, it's just on your list. Um, the previous list you had about how many pounds of this you had to have a day and how many pounds of that. Yeah. I think about my own breakfast, for example, like maybe one egg, one piece of toast, and a piece of bacon or something like that. Call it breakfast. Yeah. A little bit of fruit or yogurt, and or and, and call it breakfast. Maybe lunch, maybe not have lunch. When I have a steak, I certainly don't need a pound of steak. Yeah. You know, I might have eight ounces, half a potato, and some vegetables, and, yeah. and call that supper. But it seems to me you're eating a lot of food, like pounds of stuff. I can't yeah. think of eating pounds of food today. Yeah, like five pounds a so day. So why is that? Well, I think partly we're getting more sugar and fat in a smaller portion of food yeah. uh, in the kind of stuff that we would normally eat. And so that you can eat less food and get way more calories. Um, and partly it goes back to what I talked about where I was looking at the fish data for how many calories are in a pound of fish, but it's based just on the fillets. And there's no fat in the fillets. Where if I eat half as much fish, but I eat the skin and I eat the eyeballs and I eat the brains and I eat the tongue and all the parts that are all the best nutrition, the organs, I'll probably get twice as many calories from half as much fish. So it could be that I only have to eat three pounds a day, which maybe sounds more reasonable than eating five pounds a day. So we also have a couple of recipes to share. This is like my standby, uh, heat plus meat and eat. So this is what I do with lots of foods. Um, so that's kind of my recipe contribution. It's a secret family recipe, you can't take a picture of that. So here is uh, Delphine's slow cooker catfish. We ate a lot of this slow cooker catfish. So there's one catfish in a slow cooker, skin on, Swim bladder present, uh, heart, liver. None of them had eggs in them, maybe. <clears throat> the catfish. Uh, a cup of sauteed wild leeks. So these are ones that we had dried the leaves or we had pickled the bulbs. <coughs> a cup of sumac. Everybody knows what sumac is with the big red flower spike. So we were using that as a lemon flavor, basically, replacement. A tablespoon of spruce tip salt. So spruce tip salt is sea salt and you add spruce tips and you let it sit for weeks or a month and then it's a, a nice flavored salt that you can use for cooking. Uh, some maple syrup and then just turn it on and walk away. Come back a few hours later or you leave it overnight and you have a really delicious catfish. Um, Pancakes is a familiar one, but we would do them and have done them with the acorn flour, probably also mixed with uh, cattail pollen or the sedge seed flour. So we would grind down those sedge seeds. You can add a sweet flavor, such as a puree of any kind of berry or fruit that you've got, uh, or flower petals. Uh, savory spice mix of garlic, mustard, leek, plantain seed, dried pulverized mushroom of choice. I have lots of dried mushrooms set aside. And then just mix it up, cook pancakes. Add maple syrup on top. Uh, nettle pesto. This is a really good one too. So five cups of stinky nettle, 
uh, you boil it, strain it, chop it, two cloves of garlic, because we are going to grow a little bit of garlic for our year, two tablespoons of sumac decoction. So this is like the concentrated tea that would carry that lemon flavor. A half a cup of hazelnuts or black walnuts. We are planning to do a drive down south to collect as many black walnuts as we can to add to our diet and maybe also to try and press uh, walnut oil out of the walnuts. Mix, refrigerate, and then serve. And then you can also use it to add as a flavor to pasta, which we won't have unless we make it out of bark. We will have pasta. Okay. Dolphy's got a plan for pasta. Make it out of what? Pasta. Inner bark. To mix it with pasta or crackers. Um, were, you, were you making the bark or the pasta? <laughs> oh, the inner bark of trees, you can sometimes take it out and strip it and then um, into long strips and cook it like that. And it's a kind of a noodly thing that you can eat. Um, so those are the recipes. So if you're interested to in more information or you want to follow along, I document all these kinds of activities on my YouTube channel. Uh, my channel is called One Wild Crafter. I have 40 videos up. I've got lot, lots more coming, and I'll be doing weekly videos through the year that are just about the wild foods eating. Delphine's on Instagram, at Delphine Collier. So she's also doing lots of great photographs and posting photographs of our wild foods and our adventures on, uh, on Instagram. The maple syrup was like, less than two minutes capped and set aside and it was already to have a picture of it on Instagram. <laughs> and you can take the Wilderness Living Challenge. So I, I said I would talk about ways that people can participate. If you're interested, you can learn a little bit about uh, wild foods that you might want to mix with your regular foods. Or you might want to challenge yourself to once in the summer or once a week or once a month put together a meal that's all wild sourced. Right? Or you can try maybe what I've done in the past and have a whole five day period or seven day period where you're eating just wild foods. And that I find it's a real eye opener for what's out and available. But also when you're out in places like Laurier Woods, um, you start to appreciate that wild space for more than what you appreciated it for in the past. And you start to see all the edibles um, and the other resources that are there and available. Any other questions? Yes? Do you have a way uh, to quantify how much money you're going to save? Like, you're going to be putting a lot more effort into preparing food, but... Like... Yeah, so we won't have a personal grocery bill, but we still have to feed our children. Mm -hmm. um, and probably we'll spend a little more gas traveling. So I wasn't really planning to track expenses, but I would guess that we'll spend a little bit more money in gas, although we normally would be out canoeing and hiking and doing those things anyway, for the most part. Anybody else? So if we get a partridge with a, with a car, we can give it to you. Sure, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Send me an email. Um, roadkill, I did, I did find one that somebody had freshly hit. I ate a grouse, I had the, the bear. I've picked up roadkill deer many times. Uh, it's surprising. Once All my you, fish guts are good too. The fish guts are good. Yeah. <coughs> I don't know if I'm taking fish gut donations because it's nice to have the rest of the fish to go with the guts. But <laughs> yes. How do you how do you pick those sticking you know staining nettles without getting staining? Leather gloves. Yeah, leather gloves and make sure they don't brush up on your arm or anything. Yeah, they hurt. Well, I think uh, some people feel them and some people don't. It's like poison ivy. I know I took my kids for a hike one time and they started crying and screaming. I'm like, what's wrong with you guys? And then I realized we were watch walking through a big nettle patch and I didn't, didn't really notice it. Maybe because they were lower to the ground. I don't know if they got the worst of it, but yeah, I leather gloves. Yeah, through the weed just stops the entry. Yeah, I haven't really had a chance to try that, but if that's your experience. Bang, it's gone. Okay. What is that? Jewel weed. Yeah. Jewel weed uh, often grows in the same areas as nettle, and so if you grab it and crush it up, and then rub like a vicious circle. You bet you're going to get the jewel weed here. The stick. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
makes green tea as well. The jewel weed? No, the nettle. Oh, the nettle, yes. Yeah, so yeah that's one that you can buy commercially too, right? Yeah, and, you, and if you boil it, you certainly don't get the, uh, the fine thorny, you know, thorns going down your throat or anything. Once yeah. you make the tea, it's really good. Yeah. I guess Gabby's once and made nettle tea. Okay. And that cured scabies. Okay. What's the question? Nettle tea can it. cure scabies. What's scabies? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we want too many details. Uh, but I was going to say the stinging nettle doesn't have, it's not a hair, I don't think. It's actually like a little uh, crystal. And so then when you put it in boiling water, it just dissolves. Uh, so, which I didn't know until relatively recently. I thought it was little spines. But. Jeremy, did, how did you capture the insects, like the crickets and the grasshoppers? Did you go ahead and catch them one at a time? <laughs> yeah. the, uh, some kind of trap. Together. So I tried this with my friend, and we had a bit of an argument. So I, I had read somewhere about um, people who would basically, uh, they would carry like blankets and hides, and they would run all the, <clears throat> hop all the crickets and grasshoppers towards a creek, and they would all jump, and they get stuck in the water, and then they float along, and then somebody's just got a big basket. Now they talked about how many millions of calories worth of crickets and grasshoppers could be collected in one day of communal effort. So I said, we just have to get this blanket and run across the field. Well, we caught like two, right? Running around, <laughs> we're 40 years old, running around with a blanket, catching. Anyway, so I started just catching them one by one. Just like a kid, you just jump on them. You spend like 10 calories, you get two, you spend 10. <laughs> so I really was just doing it. What about the antics? Uh, and for those, I just happened to be moving firewood and I found them. And so uh, what I do is I lick my finger and then just pick up my finger and the eggs stick to it. So you can just eat them as fast as you can before the ants run away with them. What about slugs or worms? I have not eaten slugs or worms or snakes. No, they're still on my list. Not slugs. Slugs are not on my list. Frog legs, yes. Yeah, they're good. Frog are very good. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, maybe we can just catch a bunch of stuff around our houses and stuff, and we'll just give you a, you know, we we'll give you a text you and say, hey, yeah. I got a trap yeah. ten mice. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> I see what's going to happen next year. <laughs> yeah. You're in a game wait on the next yeah, yeah. I wanted to go goose hunting this weekend, but this guy called me up. I had to drive to his house, get these eight bikes. By the time I cleaned them all up, the day was done. Yeah. You uh, I put in the little garden that dies every year, so uh, I'm only planning to put in peppers and garlic, I think, and just really try and keep them alive. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing. Well, we we may or may not do some corn. Yeah, yeah. We're debating some other ideas about yeah. planting a, a corn patch to have a little bit of a corn ration through the year. Tomatoes. Tomatoes. I know, but then you saw and maybe some cucumber, no, maybe some squash. Really yeah. yeah. Anderson. I was just gonna say when you were talking about flavor and spices. Yeah. Another good way to uh, flavor your meat is uh, sm by smoking it. Yes. Yeah. Using different woods. Yeah. Heat moss, barks of uh, tree. Spruce branches, black spruce. Yeah. Yeah. I have a little bit of tried it. Um, smoking fish with a uh, alder chips mostly is what I've done. It's a good way to preserve your meat too and your fish. Yeah. If you smoke it and you dry it, you can keep it for, uh, for a long time. For a long time. You're going to be picking your brains about that. <laughs> and I think I shared with you before, um, when you eat the uh, bone marrow and, bo and when you use the bones for broth, you can get a lot of nutrients from Yes. That. Well, that's, uh, I forgot to mention that, but what I found is we made the stew with the beaver and I was doing stew with the catfish and straining the broth out and then put it in the fridge overnight because I couldn't eat it all at once. But I, like you literally could turn the pot upside down and it would not come out, and if it did, it would just be like a jelly cake. So it was really, really rich broth, for sure, from the bones, and the skin, and the organs. Well, Jeremy, um, obviously there, you'll be here for the next hour answering more questions than everybody else who's here. After, if you live the year, we all <laughs> certainly be interested in seeing how you did. Um, certainly, I am looking forward, and my wife is very keen too, 
in getting the beetles and crickets going into my diet. <laughs> because I don't need very much, being as old as I am, if I don't live long, it won't make any difference. Um, but in any event, I think this little gift is full of little tiny crickets and, and stuff for you. That, as a gift, you're allowed to utilize those in your effort. We certainly want to see you after the year. And uh, I'm not personally going to invest in any grocery store for a while uh, in case they disappear after we all grow our own food. <laughs> Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs>